Well, welcome everybody to the Economic Alliance is in partnership with Washington APEC um, to our Growing with Government Contracting Seminar. Um, today, we have Elisa Rodell, who is the Government uh, Contracting Assistant Specialist, who will talk to you today about government contracting um, and getting certified as an O, um, Office of Minority Women Owned Businesses and the other SBA Certi certification. So we're really excited to have Alicia here today, and we hope that you all learn a lot and have a lot to take away from this workshop today. So I will turn it over to Alicia. Hello, everybody. My name is Alicia Rodeau. I'm a government contracting assistant specialist, which I know is a mouthful, um, otherwise known as an APEX accelerator or an APEX advisor. Um, so a little bit about me. I've been doing this for almost six years, like kind of fell into the job. I worked in the business growth department at Greater Spokane Incorporated before that, and then was asked to come in on a grant for like 10 hours a week. My predecessor left to the Red Cross, and so here I am. Um, Zach, go ahead. So, a little bit about what we're doing today. I'm going to keep it kind of casual because we have a really small group. So if you guys have questions, please feel free to stop me at any time. Um, we got a lot to get through today, but we will stop part the way through so everybody can get up and stretch and go have your bio break or whatever it is you need to do. Um, because this is a lot to digest in a short time. Um, go ahead. So a little bit about the program. Um, this program was established in 1985 because Congress wanted small businesses to do business with the federal government. So my primary focus is to assist small businesses through the muddy waters of government contracting, um, but that sits on the federal, state, and the local levels of contracting. So I don't just focus on one area, I focus on several areas. Uh, although myself and my entire state team have our realms of expertise, if I don't know it, I'm not going to pretend I know it, and I'll just drop with you off with somebody who does, and then they'll give me back when he does. Um, but the program, uh, we used to be known as PEAK, which we'll cover in a minute, but the program is funded by the Department of Defense. Um, it used to be through the Defense Logistics Agency, but I didn't update this slide, but uh, part of my funding comes from the Department of Defense, and the other part comes from my house, which in this case is Greater Spokane. Go ahead. So um, we have eight centers across the state, and then we have another sub-center that covers Wall in Jefferson County. Um, she is not tied to our program. However, we have basically adopted her in, so she's family too. Um, my region is region seven. So I myself cover 11 counties. Um, so I stay very busy. I, if I get too spread out, I do have um, backup and the rest of my team can jump in just like we did for each other. If somebody is gone or needs more help. Um, so, Part of what I help with is certifications and registration. So certifications, we're going to cover some of that today, whether it's on the state or federal side of the house, we're going to focus on state today. Um, registration is making sure to register in the portals that you're supposed to be in um, to do business with the government, whether it's um, on the federal, state, or local level. Um, finding the opportunities. So the, the finding opportunities is a little bit like an, an endless portal. Um, just like registrations are, but it's just knowing where to look to help get you rolling in the right direction, and then we can keep going from there. Um, interpreting or understanding the solicitations and regulations, so some of them are more easy to understand than others. Um, federal solicitations can be a lot to digest because they put all the rules and regulations, they just dump them all in there, and you're expected to dissect their legal jargon, but that's what I'm here for. Um, marketing to government buyers, so um, we're going to cover something called the capability statement a little bit later on, and that's one way to uh, market to a government buyer. But we do these things through like workshops just like this. I also do one on one counseling sessions, whether that's on the phone, over Zoom, or in person, whatever the preference is. Um, some people learn better one way or the other, so I try to be flexible in that being. Um, also, those matchmaking events, so I'll get together some local buyers and have them come in rooms and on the panel or do their however long spiel. And then you guys would ask the questions to them. Um, Washington APAC also has an option. They match service. Not going to tell you anything. 
is a fee based service, it's like one of the only things that's a fee based service when it comes to my program, but that's because it's outsourced, but it's very cheap in comparison to what you'll find in the general marketplace. But so I kind of mentioned we used to be known as PTAC. So uh, our program was rebranded recently. And the reason being is we were stuck underneath the Defense Logistics Agency. And with that, our um, bandwidth um, constraints were pretty tied to three things. And if we didn't make those three things, we got slapped on the hand for it. And um, Department of Defense and Small Business Contracting was plummeting because we were a best kept secret. Um, so they didn't want that to happen anymore. So they yanked us off and underneath DLA and put us into the Office of Small Business Program. So that way we'd be um, more visible and more widely used. Um, and with that, you know, we got a new name because DOD likes to 3D things. Um, but hopefully it helps with the mission and it will be everything we're supposed to be doing. Um, my services pretty much didn't change. It's just basically the name. And I have a lot more flexibility when I'm able to do it. Go ahead. Um, so before you get into government contracting, you kind of got to take a couple of steps back and um, do a self-assessment. So a uh, solid business plan is important. I am never going to ask you to see your business plan, but never, ever. The reason why it's important is because funding, um, without a business plan, you can't get a business loan. Um, so that's important if you want to be able to jump into contracting. And then do you have at least two years of experience in the commercial marketplace? Okay. That doesn't mean your business has to be in business for two years. All it means is that you know what you're doing. So you yourself has had experience in this field in the commercial marketplace. Um, one of my best examples of that is I work, um, one of my realms of expertise happens to be uh, wildland fire expression. Um, so I work with the Forest Service and the Viper contracts, virtual incident procurement contracts, a lot. Um, my, one of my very first clients was a water tender. Uh, he had just started the business a couple of months before we started, um, but he'd been in the field for 20 years. So that fills that two-year need. Um, there are some programs within my programs um, that you will need to have two years of experience before you can even tackle, but my services are definitely not one of them. Um, and then do you have a strong cash flow, a line of credit, or a loan in place in order to cover upfront costs? So contracting requires a lot of upfront costs. So that might be where the business plan falls in, really. It's because sometimes you'll have to go get a loan to float your business for like the first three months of a contract because depending on the agency will depend on how soon you get paid. You could be having to float your business four or five months before you see payment from the government. Okay. Anything. So, really, the first step to getting into government contracting, feel free to move forward, is market research. Should I do this? Um, so, some key questions to ask yourself is uh, which agencies are buying it now? Who are they buying it from now? How are they buying it? And how much are they spending on it? Um, the reason why these are important is because um, if I, I had a client come in and said, I'm, I'm doing business with me. You are not going to tell me anything different. I am absolutely doing business with Navy. They they buy what I sell, hundred percent. Through market research, we figured out that they absolutely did not buy what he sold. <laughs> like not in any way, shape, or form. It was actually the army. Um, but it's just figuring out who is actually buying the services um, or products that you're selling, and then how often they're buying it. Because if it's like they're buying the stuff in bulk. It might be a year or better before they decide they're going to buy that bulk item again. Um, and then how are they buying it? So sometimes there's a fixed firm contract, or sometimes it's an indefinite delivery contract, um, or just a one and done purchase order. It really just depends. And then who are they buying it now? That piece is important because um, they could be that person could be your company, could be your prime contractor, um, your teaming partner, your joint venture partner. Um, or your foot in the door. They could be your mentor later down the road. It's not necessarily your competition at this point. Okay. So there's a few different places we like to go for market research. One of the first places I like to take clients is USA Spending. The reason for that is because the information on here is easy to digest. There are some other websites like SPDS, which is where this information comes from. 
but is a lot harder to navigate. And especially for my less tech, tech savvy clients, I bring them here first. So USAspending.gov has all awards over $3,000 since 2008. Um, and that could be a, a purchase order and a definitely gift IDIQ, so indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. Um, it could just be like a one year contract or one and done. Um, as long as it's over $3,000 since 2008, you can find it on check. Um, you can search by many, many different things. So your search criteria is pretty much endless. You can search by keyword, you can search by NAICS codes, the area it's in. Um, if you know somebody who won an award, we can look at that too. Um, and there's some really important information that are on that's on this site that will help you figure out if this is right. So like one of them is transaction history. So you can see how soon that agency is actually paid. Um, and then how many things have changed within the scope of that contract once, once we get Go ahead. Um, so this is just a very small example of like the search results at the end of it. So like I said, you could do it by Nate's codes, location, keyword, fiscal year. When I go through market research with a client, I usually have a blank piece of paper with myself, or if it's for Zoom, recommend that they do it as well. Um, because if you're searching by keywords, you might find a different Nate's code or a North American classification code that you wouldn't have thought you could be tied to, or if you don't know which one you fit under, that would be a way to figure out what you're fitting to. Um, and then I always make notes of like, okay, I see Department of Defense 10 times, and then I saw, you know, um, the Forest Service twice, and then the VA three times. All right, maybe we're targeting the Department of Defense overall to start with. Go ahead. Um, and then there's other ways to search for historical data on the state and local side of the house, too. That information can get a lot harder to find. Um, that's kind of where we come. Um, we have access to a couple of different databases that would be ridiculously expensive if you guys went to pay for them on your own. Um, but because you're a client, we can sit there and we can go through it all together. Um, and then it's not a cost for you guys. It's not anything else it's out of pocket. So, you know, cities, counties, school districts, PUDs, um, fire districts, conservation districts, potato commission. Um, when I say school districts, that even trickles into the universities and the colleges as well. Uh, and then your local VAs would be on here too in some of these. So there's like the U.S. Veterans Affairs and then there's the Washington State Veterans Affairs. The funding flows down differently. So they would say the results would be, would be in two different spots. Go ahead. Um, so after you do your self-assessment, like, okay, you know, is there enough money here to buy the products and services that I sell. Um, chances are the answer is going to be yes. Um, my predecessor actually helped somebody up at the Boundary Dam win a contract for bird watching. He literally stood there and watched an eagle's nest all day while they did work on Boundary Dam. So that's what he did for the whole day. Um, I did a similar presentation. Huh? Yeah, it would be amazing. <laughs> right? It would be an amazing job. I would love it. I would be in heaven. Um, well, I did this this same presentation and used that same example um, up in Iowa, and the, that lady or the lady said, "Taylor, that's what he was doing." Like she she drove it. by every day, seeing this guy with binoculars looking at the looking at the dam. She couldn't figure out what he was doing. Well, she figured it out. But yeah, go ahead. So if yes, then now we get ready. So it's the preparing step. So what is the NAICS code? Touched on it several times. I skewed the acronym super fast, but it's a North American industry classification system. Um, basically, it's a giant number tree that starts at two, goes to six. Um, and even though it's supposed to be specific, it's really, it makes codes are not specific. They're broad industry classification codes. Um, they're also used by the Small Business Administration to determine whether or not this company is actually small. Um, which small is actually big. I hate to say it that way, but um, for some NAICS codes, it's $36 million. Anything under $36 million a year, you're considered small. Um, some other ones are $10 million, which, and under $10 million, you're considered small. Um, but basically, they're utilized. Some of them are based off of number of employees, which are like research and development or manufacturing companies. 
And then the other ones, every, pretty much everybody else is based off of an income threshold. So construction is a really good example of that. Even at 5,000 employees, you still never make $36 million a year. Um, so you're still considered small. Go ahead. Um, so as you start getting into here, uh, there's a lot of misguiding information. A client and I were actually joking around the other day that he is from the University of YouTube um, because he was YouTubing all of this stuff in government contracting and some of it's right, a lot of it's not. Um, it just depends on the source. Just like when you're Googling stuff on the internet, you know, not everything on the internet is true. Not everything in Facebook is true. Things like that. Not everything <laughs> on YouTube <laughs> is, is true. true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as you're starting to get in there, you know, stay slow down, um, especially on the federal side of the house. Uh, the federal government basically knows everything. Is free. So we're going to hear about a SAM registration today, which is a system for working in. That registration is free. If there isn't a cost. So if you ever Google SAM registration or system for work management, chances are the first three or four you see are, are not the correct one. If it doesn't say SAM.gov, don't do it. Um, they're going to charge you to register on their site. And you may or may not have the ability to access the stuff after you give them your information. Find out why you don't want to hear it. Um, when in doubt, please reach out. That says PTAC, Housing Updated, ask your Apex. Um, I will let you know whether it's legitimate email, whether it's flawed email, and what you need to look for in so the process. Um, there is one email address that's very, very common. It's the samfulfillmentcenter.com. That is garbage. Do you need it? Block it. Don't worry about it. Um, go ahead. So registration. So I kind of touched base on this. So SAM or the System for Award Management Registration. This is on the federal side of that. Um, a lot of what I'm covering in the first part is going to be pertinent to the federal, but since we are focusing on state certifications, we will go into that today too. Um, so it's a, you have to have an active registration to do this with the federal government. It's free to register and free to renew. Um, once you register the first time, getting through the renewal process is actually a lot quicker as long as nothing drastic has changed in your company. Honestly, a lot of things have changed. Um, but before you register, you have to have your tax identification number handy. Um, so your TAN or EIN, they're used in the of the area, your bank information. So that is your routing number and your account number. This is why we don't want to give it to a third party, because it is literally the routing and account number for your business bank account. Um, and then your NAICS code. So you have to know what your North American classification code is. If you don't know what it is, if we had gone through the market research yet, we would figure it out along the way. Go ahead. So this is just a sample of what the SAM, the legitimate SAM website actually looks like. Um, you're basically in that red dot in the box. That's where you're going to go to get started. So SAM registration is a couple of step process. Has anybody heard of down numbers? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we don't use them in government contracting. Uh, a long time ago, we used to use Dunn's numbers. Uh, Dunn and Bradstreet lost the contract to issue that unique entity ID, and it got um, engulfed into this. So first, you would apply for the unique entity ID. Um, if you validate your company, which is fairly simple to do as long as you have the correct document, um, Secretary of State is really the easiest way to do it. Um, and then uh, we'll go through after you get assigned your UEI and then the rest of the registration. So on the federal side of the house, so these numbers aren't locked in stone on the state and local side of the house. On the federal side, they are. Um, these levels actually fluctuate on the state side um, depending on the agency. So that's why in my one-on-one -on -one class, I cover federal. Um, it's a little bit less confusing because it's set all the way across. Um, so anything under $10,000 for products or $2,500 for services. If you're construction online, then it's $2,000 for construction. This is considered the micro-purchase threshold. This is a who you know area. Um, and the reason why is because underneath this threshold, the government is not required to post it publicly. They are not required to um, solicit it for multiple 
um, bids. They just need to know who you are. So they could essentially call you and say, hey, I would like you to come to or clean a couple of those on a couple of courses and that's it. And it's that they call, they pay you with a government purchase card or their version of credit card. Um, it makes it pretty easy for them and for you. It's the hard part is for them to know you exist, um, which is where the marketing needs to come in. So from there up to $24,999, the government, the federal government is required to make the opportunity public and get quotes from at least three vendors. Now, public means public in some form. Um, it could be on Facebook, it could be on X or formerly Twitter, it could be on their website, it could be in the local newspaper, it could literally be a memo posted in a public lobby. That is public. And then they get they are required to get a minimum of three quotes and then go through the full full blown evaluation process. They have to score them, rank them, pass performance, all the things. Um and so at that level, you have to be registered with SAM because the federal government doesn't like to write checks. They would rather just direct deposit the money into your account, less headache for everybody. Um, so marketing is still really important at this level because they don't necessarily know you exist. Again, at every level, it's going to be important, just like it is in the current level. So everything over $25,000 must be posted on SAM.gov on the federal site for house. So again, three websites. So this website actually acts as a, several things. Uh, it's where you register, so you can do business with the federal government. It's where you search for opportunities with the federal government. And there's some contracting data, historical information that you can find on this website as well. Um, it's kind of a catch-all. It used to be a very, very um, minimally used space. And they went from the federal government to 10 legacy sites, and they're dumping them all into this one to make it easier. Not having to go to 10 different logins, it'll just be like, thank goodness. <laughs> um, you can also set up, set up a search agent on SAM.gov. So if you find something um, that works really well for you, as long as you're signed in, um, and you don't have to have a full full blown registration to do this, you just create a login.gov account and then start saving search criteria. You get emailed the searches as new things pop up. Go to the website, look at them, um, and then it helps. It takes hours. Please. Um, uh, go ahead. So this is just a just a sample of the search page. So anytime you're searching, and I know it's hard to see it here, it's probably easier for them. Um, you guys will have access to the full slide deck once this is done as well, so you guys can keep it. Um, but when it auto defaults to all domains, but when you're searching for something, you click the contract opportunity, and then there's several filters you can filter by. So you can use those keywords and those names, those and those location pieces again. Sam.gov is newer in the sense that every time you change the search criteria, it will change with you. Um, USA spending is a little bit older and funkier, it doesn't quite do that. You have to reset your search. Go ahead. So, this is just a sample of a search result. Um, the part that's circled is the updated solicitation. So there's like, there's roughly 10 different types of postings or more in SAM.gov. However, these five are really the ones you want to pay attention to because they're going to be A, the most common, and B, the most relevant to your company. Um, so a source of thought is the government doing its market research. Um, they, responding to this will not guarantee you a contract. It won't even give you a contract. But what this piece does is um, it helps A, it gives you visibility, um, and B, it helps um, shape the form of the actual solicitation. Now, the way that that happens is that, uh, so they'll, I'll use a trail bridge, for example, because I've mentioned this. Um, a lot of times they'll have like the parks with all the walking trails and stuff like that. And from time to time, they need to be made. Um, there was a source of stop posted for a trail maintenance, but they needed a new bridge because it had to be it was washed out over um, some creek. They didn't anticipate for flooding in their source of salt, so they posted it. They posted some dimensions for this bridge, and the client that I was working with said, um, that's why he goes, well, it needs to be retired or it's going to get washed out again. I said, all right, response, tell them that. Um, that response helped them fix their actual solicitation because if they would have moved forward the way it was, 
then they would have had to do 500 change orders because they didn't anticipate for the slope or the extra cost of lumber or all of the other things. So that's one of the reasons why it's important is because you're actually helping form the solicitation. The other reason why it's important is because um, the federal government does their best to try and uh, award or solicit to small businesses underneath the simplified acquisition pressure. So that's $250,000 generally um, or under. They want that to a small business. That's usually a more manageable dollar amount for a small business, so they try their hardest to get it there. Um, if you and one other um, small business respond with a sufficient response, the federal government can then use the rule of two that are just like this. That also goes if you're a certified firm. So if you're a woman-owned certified firm, a veteran-owned certified firm, a HUB-owned certified firm, or an AA firm, if you and one other of that category um, submit sufficient responses, they can set it aside specifically for that category. Um, so it won't get you a contract, but it'll help get you closer to the contract. Um, Pre-solicitation pre is basically your get ready. Fair warning, we're going to open a bid. Solicitation is okay. We're going to bid. Um, special notice that one's a good one to keep an eye on as well because a lot of times an agency will post an industry day, and that's the category that we strike is a special notice. Um, industry days are their way of doing market research as well. So it won't always be posted as a source of thought. I actually help industry days for Fair Travel Air Force Base when they were um, doing market research for their new laundry contract. And then award is just, it's, it's exactly what it does. Somebody was um, And then there's something called a set aside. So there's types and set asides. If it's set aside for small businesses, that means only small businesses can bid. And then the certification. Okay. So state local side of the house. Um, that will be the focus after um, this presentation. So I'll even though I don't have a ton of slides on it, I'll touch a little bit deeper too. Um, so on the state and local side of the house, there's also 500 million different procurement portals. In Washington, the most common one is WEBS, or Washington Enterprise for Business Solutions, which um, will be, um, well, they're not going to lose their baby, but MRSC has recently been dubbed the state roster. Um, and as of July 1st, uh, it will be utilized as a state roster. Now, roster versus procurement portal are different things. Um, but WEBS is where you will need to be registered in before you can pursue the certifications we will be talking about after um, we have our break. So uh, basically, any state agency can issue their solicitation in WEBS. They do not do sources thoughts in the same sense as the federal government does. Um, they structure them a little bit differently. Their source of thoughts are more personal touches, so they'll reach out, they'll find the small businesses, they'll reach out, they'll ask them questions, and then they'll find certifications. Um, so it is it is structured in a different manner. Um, MRIC rosters, again, that's a municipality uh, level roster. So um, when you go to MRSC.org, you can click on the county and you can see all the entities that are registered there. So uh, commonly P and D's use it, um, counties, cities, um, universities will use it as well. Uh, National Park Services can use it or your local park services can use it. Um, it's really not a limited platform, but basically what it is is you register for as, as a roster to see things from specific counties. Um, the re basic registration is free up to nine counties or nine um, agencies that you're taking. Uh, after that, there is a fee associated with it. We're trying, they are trying to do away with the fee since rules and regulations are changing, but it's happening in baby steps. And so hopefully at some point there won't be one of them. Um, and then Spokane County is listed on there just an, as an example. Um, uh, Spokane County does use MRSC rosters, but they also utilize their own. So there's other ones called Secureware. Um, Public Works roster. There's quite a few of them, but we're all trying. They're all trying to migrate to the new MRSC roster platform due to some rules and regulations. Go ahead. Um, subcontracting. So subcontracting can actually be your best avenue to get into contracting, and there's a few reasons why. So 
The first reason is you don't have to go through all the work bidding as a prime. It is easier for you to work with a prime contractor than compete with all the big agencies as, as a prime contractor. There's a lot less administrative work because you don't, you're not dealing directly with the government. Um, it'll help you gain experience so that you can be the prime down the road. Some agencies will not allow you to even bid as a prime unless you have past performance. Other agencies have no problem giving it to you when you go on board. Um, and that, and the reason for that is because they would rather give it to somebody they've never worked with than somebody they have and didn't do a good job. Um, but doing it as a subcontractor, especially if you're in a niche field, can be your way in, as opposed to trying to bid on it as a prime and then sub everything else out because it, without those relationships. Um, and then your own, and, in a lot of circumstances, you're only required to have that UEI and not the full blown SAM registration, which is a lot um, less admin work for you all the way down there. Go ahead. So, finding subcontracting opportunities is almost identical to searching how they find. Um, the only difference is, is that in some circumstances, that prime will just reach directly out to you. There's also a couple of other places that they would put their opportunities versus um, the way the federal government is required to put it. So a lot of prime contractors, they'll post it directly on the website. Um, they will also reach out to people that they know because prime contractors aren't tied to the same rules and regulations as the federal agency, federal or state or local agency. Um, some prime contractors also post their opportunities on OMWBE.gov. Uh, and with on OMWBE, which we'll cover later today, too. Um, the Apex Accelerator website, the Washington Apex website, a prime contractor can also go put their there. So they have, they can post their opportunities differently. Um, so there are some other areas where you can find them, but a lot of it is the same thing. You would use USA spending to figure out who's in the area um, to go introduce yourself and make friends with. Uh, you'd also use SAM.gov because. My theory on it is if they're in SAM.gov, they're in good standing. So they're not delinquent on their taxes. They've never been to bar. They've never gotten in trouble. So SAM.gov is a good resource for that. Um, attending networking events. So if this room is full of people, you guys would have people around the table to introduce yourself and potentially work with too, as a subcontractor, as a teaming partner, so on and so forth. Or ask me. Um, a lot of times I will have a prime contractor reach out and be like, hey, who I, I don't have anybody to do this. Do you know anybody? And so I'll, I will look it up. If they give me an ACE code, I basically filter it out my database and ship it out. Um, I can't give my clients information to a prime contractor or an agency without permission. Um, so if you ever see, hey, I have an opportunity you might be interested in, a prime contractor, even X, Y, and Z, can I make the connection? You say yes, then I can make a connection. If I don't ever hear from you, which happens a lot, um, then whoever responds is going to get the connection made, basically. Um, I actually have an agency looking for um, construction companies right now, and I've reached out to local constru construction companies in that area, and nobody's responding. So now I get to broaden my search and keep going. So somebody can subscribe. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the other things. Go ahead. Um, so certifications, we'll touch base on both of these today. We're going to go deeper into the Washington state one here in a little bit, but on the federal side of the house, certifications have, um, goals tied to them on the federal side of the house. These goals are like, you must do everything you can to meet this goal. And if you don't meet this goal, you have to explain why. Um, so there's rules and regulations tied to the federal side of the house. State side, not so much. Every state agency does make goals. They do their best um, to meet those goals, but the only one that they have a percentage tied to is the veteran business. And that's because there was a rule passed several years ago about being race and gender neutral. So they weren't able to be like, okay, we could do 5% minority and 5% women, so on and so forth. Um, so on the federal side of the house, their small business goal is 40% under that simplified acquisition threshold. So there's, and this is up, it used to only be 25%. This has come up 
um, almost double just in the last couple of years. So they're really trying to be hard to do business with small business. Uh, they also have a woman-owned small business goal and economically disadvantaged women-owned small business goal. Again, this one has been raised. So it was just a couple of years ago, it was 5%. Now it's 9%. It will continue to go up. These goals on the federal side continue to go up. Um, 8A, which is actually a nine-year program, uh, they have a five percent goal for that. Service disabled veteran owned is three percent, and a hub zone, which is a historically underutilized business zone, which most of the Okanagan County is actually in. Um, there's a three percent goal for that. On the state side of the house, so we have minority business, women business, minority woman combination, um, which seeing the combination business enterprise that one's pretty rare because it's a uh, like a white male and a minority female, and it's fifty fifty. It's it's a strange piece to navigate. Um, and then there's also the socially and economically disadvantaged business enterprise, the veteran business enterprise, which is not through OMWBE, it's actually through a different program. And then we have a brand new certification called the Public Work Small Business Enterprise. Now that one is a race and general neutral certification as well, and Public Works pretty much everything is neutral, um, which also have to tie into that new MRSC uh, rules and regulations for women to be Go ahead. So, a capability statement. I told you we would touch on this. So, here is our touch. So, basically, a capability statement. Here's your techie definition on the screen. The way I usually talk to people about it is that it's basically a resume for your business. Um, it will function in the exact same capacity as a resume for your business. It's just, um, very direct, the not all fluffy stuff, um, and it's formatted so the government doesn't have to hunt for what you do. Um, a lot of small businesses that I work with, uh, what I do the first time around with the capability statement is I just say brain dump, throw it, everything, put all the spaghetti on the wall, we'll pick out what is relevant and what's not. Um, as small business owners, nine times out of ten, that small business is the blood of your being. Um, so you're very proud of it, and rightfully so. I would be too. Um, but it's taking out the fluffy and just being very direct to the point about what your business is and what it's going to do for the government. So basically your capability statement is you have a problem, like this is your solution. Like you're giving them the solution to their problem. Um, so that's why it's hard to revamp those in a in a mindset that is more realistic for the end user, end user as opposed to us. Go ahead. So there's several ways you're going to use your capability statement. So if you call the contracting officer or a prime contractor, you would um, you'd be able to use that as like a follow-up. Can I email you my capability statement? You can put them as it on your website. So a lot of small businesses that have websites will put just a separate tab, capability statement. You're also going to have like one for the federal space, and one for the state space, because there's a little bit of different information that's going to be put on that. Um, you can use it as a takeaway with your elevator speech. So I host an event called Meet with Dates every year um, in the fall. And uh, <laughs> thing. Hi. Um, and you can take that as a takeaway with your elevator space. Beach. So basically, you'll go stand in front of the booth. You will um, talk about, you know, here, here's who I am and here's what I do, and you leave that as a takeaway. So, like Fairchild Air Force Base, they have a small business liaison. That man is designated to do nothing but introduce you to the right department. Um, so, when I introduce a company to them, first thing he asks for it, can you send me your capability statement? If you don't have one, he will send you that. I promise. He said several times. <laughs> um, but it's also a good way to like, if you come to an event like this, if there's a lot more people in the room or a meet the agencies event, and we have like a um, like a networking session at the end, we can network well, we can get into like, you know, potential teaming partners or the prime contractors, the agencies, any, any and all of those things. Um, and then large businesses. So it's really good, even in the commercial space for you to 
um, take a capability statement into a potential prime contractor because again, it's like direct and to the point of everything that you do, um, and then they know what you do and how it works. Go ahead. We do have a question in the chat, Alicia. Yep. John would like some examples of a capability statement um, he can share with the slide deck. Okay. Next slide, please. So this is a very small picture, but this is one version of the capability statement we have. Um, I will, and I can email Ronnie out the capability statement templates I have. Um, okay. I actually teach a whole another hour long class on nothing but capability statements, but basically the front of your capability statement, and I don't know how many fishermen are in the room, but it's the term I use. Um, the front of your capability statement is going to be your hook and your line. The back of your capability statement that's really going to be where your sinker sits. Um, so the front of your capability statement is going to have your summary statement, so a brief two sentences, two to three sentences of what your company does. Very direct, very straightforward, very to the point. Um, and then you're going to have a bulleted list of what your core competencies are. So I usually say three to five things. What are what's the three to five bread and butter pieces to your company? Um, and we try to keep tech jargon out of it um, because the contracting officer you're handing it to might not have any idea what it is you're trying to tell them that you do. Uh, and then we'll have a section called a differentiator section. Um, and not and it this is to sound rude or disrespectful in any way, but I call it my so what section. Like, so what? Why should I do business with you? Um, and it's really what makes you different from your competition. So that piece is going to be like the three to five bulleted items again. And you can't see it on the screen, but uh, here's an example of it here in the room. Um, this is actually one of the templates that we do work through together, but it goes through for you that are in the room. Um, it has your summary, your core competencies, your differentiators. This one has a past performance section because this company has past performance. If you don't have past performance with the government or any commercial contracts, what we do is we'll swap that out for something called experience. Experience isn't limited to your company. Experience is all in company need. So I have um, some Army veterans that are medics, for example. Um, fresh out of the military, never had a company before, uh, but has had 20 years of medical experience in the field. Like in the field. Um, so we use that in this section instead. And then on the left-hand column, which is kind of the same on the screen, it's probably hard, it's going to be hard for you guys to see. You're going to have like your um, all your contractor data. So it's the name of your company, it's the address, it's your email, it's the contact person, not just info at blah blah blah. It's Nathaniel Harris, you know, CEO. Um, and then if you have sort of small business certification, so if you are a disadvantaged business enterprise or a woman-owned small business or any of those, a veteran-owned small business, put them there. If you're a member of any professional organization, so um, in the construction world, that's associated builders, contractors, or associated general contractors, um, and pictures are encouraged on a capability statement, which is not something that's usually encouraged on something like a resume. Um, a picture will speak a thousand words, and a contracting officer might not know what this gadget is um, if you put it written. But if you see the picture of it, yeah, that, that's what I want. Go call that company. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we encourage pictures on there. That, and if you're really new to the game um, and you don't have the kind of information to put on here, you, and you've got pictures of your work, it helps you out. It shows what you've done outside of the um, government space. On the back of the capability statement, um, we like to, if you're a services based company, we put testimonies on the back because that is somebody else's opinion on how good of a job you do. Um, if you're a product based company, we'll have a list. There's going to be a little table here and it's going to have a list of all your products on there. You can put testimonies on there as well if you're a product based company, but that's what that is. And then we put industry standard certifications on the back. Um, so if you are the only thing, um, if you are the only company in your industry that has a, a certification, um, so there's like this certification that's highly sought after in your industry, but you know that no one else in your area, we put that in your different section. Now, if you're a trucking company and a CDL is required, obviously that doesn't make you different from anybody else. So we put that on the back of the paper. <laughs> um, 
So it's just those pieces. Hopefully I answered that question online, but like I said, I can send out the templates if you some um, go down with more information with that. Go ahead. So the last step to contracting, well, the third step to contracting is responding to a solicitation or I like to call this my what have I done phase. <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Because um, after you get the first things done, um, we really, you know, that's again, that's not something we dive into today because responding to a solicitation can be a several hour process. It is a several hour process. Just reading it alone, um, that will take two, three, four, five hours because you're going to read it, you're going to read it again, and you're going to reread it so you understand it thoroughly. And even after you read it three times, you're probably going to keep reading it some more. Um, every time I've read a solicitation, including one I have read multiple times, I learn something new, and I read the same one a hundred times. So that's really for another time. So now, or do we have any more questions? Because that was like a fire hose of information. Yes. The next, the next part is going to be another fire hose of information. So we can take a few minutes to breathe, do a bio break, and answer whatever questions you guys have. And we'll have this to go. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I emailed a copy of it to Ronnie already, but I'll put it, I can put it in a PDF and email. Yep. No yep. questions. That's what look like. See. Uh, do we want to pause for a minute so you can get up and stretch your legs or is everybody good? Everybody's good? Okay. So the next part, if everybody's ready to keep going, and I didn't say I, I didn't see any yes with how we break in the chat either. So it's uh holler now or forever hold your there's one. <laughs> Let's go. All right, perfect. Okay. <laughs> So the next thing we're going to go through is the Office of Minority Women Business Enterprise. Go ahead. So the Office of Minority Women Business Enterprise is where a is a state agency charged with certifying small businesses. Um, there are generally fees associated with this. However, these fees have been waived through June of 2025. Now they actually just extended the waive or the fee waiver, um, which is really nice because that means that everybody renewing gets to waive their fees as well. Um, so it's an annual, it yeah. will be an annual fee? Depends. Oh. So the, they actually have two types of certifications. Um, one is actually considered a federal certification, which we'll get into why it's weird in a minute. Um, and then the other one is the state certification. The state certifications are renewed on the Three-year basis. Their version of a federal certification is an annual basis. Uh, go ahead. So this was that certification type we just started in. So the federal certification type is actually primarily applicable to transportation projects. So the Department of Transportation and the Federal Aviation. Um, yeah, I'm going to use last act, the last A and half time, but for the airports. Uh, prime contractors also use the federal certification as well. So one of them is referred to as a DBE or a disadvantaged business enterprise. Um, one prime contractor that I know is currently searching for DBE firms is Hensel Phelps um, because their projects that they're currently working on have federal flow down dollars tied to it. They need to meet that federal certification piece. Um, there's also some other state agencies that honor. So that's uh, DBE certification too, and there's some other rules that are tied to that one as well, but it's primarily considered federal, but it's again, federal flow down dollars. Um, the state certification, there's a lot longer list of that, and basically it's any Washington state or municipality or county or city, um, even some private firms will honor the state certification as well. Um, this is one of them, uh, so this will look for the uh, WBEs and MBEs uh, to help meet their goals. They don't just allow anybody to help them meet those goals. They actually have certified firms help with those goals. 
Um, if a woman owned small business walks up to a VISTA and wants to work with the VISTA, they say, hey, I know a gal will get right, go get certified and come back. Um, because they want to help you expand your business pool at the end of the day, along with help them meet their goals. It's not just because they want to meet their goals, they, they want to help too. Um, go ahead. So on the federal side, their federal side of the house, um, which again, I'll reiterate, it's transportation related. So um, FAA or WASHOC uh, is a disadvantaged business enterprise. The airport concession disadvantaged business enterprise would be also that soup of the bunch. Um, and then the small business enterprise. So the airport concession one isn't exactly what it sounds like. It's any company that wants to do business with the airport. It's not any company that wants to have a concession stand in the airport. It's anybody. So if you're doing paint striping, um, asphalt pick correction, so if you're doing the little strips in the asphalt or whatever, um, any construction projects that is applicable to as well, um, they really should fix the name of that one because it's not just concessionaires that need it. And then the state certification, so minority business enterprise, minority women business enterprise, women combination, socially and economic. I did not add the um, PWFBE on the bottom of here yet. Um, I think that's actually listed in the next couple of slides, but yeah, go ahead. So we kind of touched base on the federal one again, but this is more information about it, and I kind of added this slide in um, from an OMWBE presentation to help give you a little bit more information about each one of these um, certifications. Now, their federal certification does require an on-site interview. Please don't panic. Uh, the reason being is their on-site interview can um, literally be pictures of you in an office. <laughs> um, and so if you're working out of your home, it's not, they're not going to come in and just invade your whole entire space. A lot of the times they're in person is actually through some virtual format because they have very limited staff. Uh, the one gal that I work with on a regular basis that's in the office, she's only actually in the office three days a week. She doesn't even answer phone calls in the office the other two days. I don't know what she's doing the other two days, probably analyzing um, certifications. But um, if I don't catch her Monday through Wednesday, I don't catch her at all that week. And then... Um, proof of residency or citizenship, that one can get a little bit tricky for some small businesses because uh, if you rent your house, that is going to be your lease agreement. If you own it, it is literally the entire ugly stack of mortgage documents. Um, and I'm not saying the first five pages, I mean, they want like the full 100 page stack. Uh, if you own it, it's a deed, which is a lot easier for homeowners to do, but it can get a little bit tricky to navigate that. Um, under certain circumstances. Uh, go ahead. So the state side of the house, um, like I said, this one's every three years instead of every year. It's for state-funded contracts, so anything that comes from Washington State, basically. Uh, applicants at this level, uh, so the women business business enterprise, not 100% about the minority business enterprise, but uh, you are eligible to apply for a relief deposit program. So what that means is, I know the veterans certification is tied to it. I believe the woman certification is tied to it. I have to do a little bit more research to figure out if the minority business one is tied to it. But uh, it can actually lower your interest rate by two, up to 2% on income, um, which can 2% might not sound like much, but when it's tied to a big fat dollar amount, it really does add up to a lot. Uh, it does not require an on-site interview, which some companies opt for only the state, but I generally recommend going to the federal and the state at the same time because it is owned OWBE functions. It's, it's one application for all of the certification types you see listed here. It's not like the federal side of the house where you're going to submit one for 8A and then another one for women-owned and then another one for veteran-owned. It's one application for all the things. Um, and then they'll, they will pick the ones that you are actually qualified to do. So if you're a white female, obviously you're not going into a minor, minority business enterprise. Uh, certification, there isn't a box to distinguish the two. They just do it as they go through the process. So, so that's why I usually recommend going through the federal and the state certification at the same time, because it's one, cert one application for both 
at the same time. If you do your state application today and in two months decide you want to go for your federal application, then you have to redo all of it and all the documents all over again. That's why I say start with federal and then check the state box. Go ahead. So this was the public works certification that had been listed. It actually just went into effect, so it's not upcoming, it is now. It is a state certification applicable to statewide small work projects. So um, primarily in the construction world. So anything that's public works, um, so building, building, uh, any infrastructure projects, janitorial can fit in there under very unique in some circumstances, along with some other um, very random ones that slide in in public works at the very early stages. After it becomes a maintenance thing, it's not public works anymore. So uh, it just depends on the category, but it's race and general neutral. So anyone can apply for it. Uh, and it just gets you on there. So on the MRSC rosters, once all of this takes effect, if you are public works or um, small work specific, what happens is when an agency searches for small business that are construction firms, those certified firms, they will show up on top. So it'll actually, the MRSC rosters will divide them in two chunks. The certified firms will be on top and the not certified firms will be on the bottom. So it will also help promote um, working with certified firms. But it's, you have to have a personal net worth of less than 1.32 million, which is applicable. It's it's easy to do, it really is, which is why everybody's giggling in the room. Um, it's excluding your primary residence and your applicant business. So if you um, are going through doing anything else besides your residence, so it does include your car. Um, if you have a rental property or anything like that, it does include that. Um, and then there's like household goods that asks for. So basically, if your jewelry is appraised and insured for like three million dollars, you probably miss it. But most cases, that doesn't apply. Um, and then the gross receipts for your company have to be thirty point four million or less, based on an average per year. So, um, and then this one again, it's just public works focused. Go ahead. So here's a little bit more information about it. I don't know if there's many construction tech firms on here. So again, you'll get these slides, but I won't dive too deep into it. Go ahead. So why get certified? So the goal is, is to work with state agencies and local governments, school districts, public universities, PUDs, parks, so on and so forth. Um, there are federally funded transportation projects that have mandatory goals. So that's going to be those federal certifications that we had spoke about. Um, state agencies and colleges have supplier diversity goals. Now they're not mandated goals, but they are goals. Um, especially because like colleges function a little bit differently. So it's harder for state to regulate like you must be things. Um, some private companies, so we already talked about Avista, um, that like to use the OMWBE certifications for their supplier diversity goals. There is a big swing um, and a big push for DEI being more inclusive and um, level across all playing fields. Instead of continuing to um, work with uh, Joe's janitorial, you, they, they're encouraging agencies and private firms to spread their wings and spread the money out. Um, go ahead. So again, why? So it's gonna help increase your visibility and it also helps include uh, uh, with the inclusion piece, because once you're certified, you're listed on the OMWB website. It's an easy one-stop shop for prime contractors and agencies to go to to say, hey, do I have any construction companies um, certified in Oklahoma County? It's super easy for them to do. All they gotta do is type construction. If they know the NAICS code, they drop it in there. Um, they, could, they don't even have to do any of that. They just can put in Okanagan County and search for every certified from here. Pretty sure that list is really small. Um, which is one of the reasons why I'm here today is to help get you guys on their radar because private industry companies will do that too. So um, I think the works out here periodically. I'm pretty sure that they have, you know, substations out here. They need help sometimes too. And so they will literally go on that list. They will see if they can find anybody. If not, they got a lot of homework to do. Um, and that goes with all prime contractors and agencies. So even if Okanagan County is looking for people, 
put to work in whatever area it is. If they are not certified, then they have to do a lot of work to try to find that company. Um, and Google may or may not be their friend at that point. Go ahead. Um, so certification eligibility for a business, we kind of touched base on this. For everybody else outside of the um, public workspace, the gross revenue has to be under um, $23.98 million. Again, that you can kind of give with that because a lot of 99% of small businesses don't need to close to that. Um, the business must be for profit. So for in order to go through certification, it can't be a nonprofit. It does have to be a for-profit company because the funding structures are different for nonprofits than they are for for-profit companies. Um, and you have to be licensed to do business in um, Washington State, and, but you have to be able to independently perform your functions. So what that means is you can't be co-dependent upon another company in order to do your daily functions. So if you share an office space, for example, with another firm, um, you, be, you have to have a separate printer, a separate computer, a separate phone line, separate display, separate everything. everything has to be separate. Because if you're if anything happens to that other business and you're codependent, then you your business fail too. Go ahead. So you have to be the eligible person or person has to own at least 51% or more of the business. Um this gets tricky most often with husband and wife teams, just to full transparency. Um, but most husband and wife teams are 50-50 and Letting that 51 49 ratio sit can be a hard pill to swallow for some spouses. Um, but if that's what you want to utilize and go with, then that's pretty much what you're going to have to do. Can't be 50 50. Um, the eligible person has to control day to day and managerial, so long term and day to day decision making. And they have to be able to provide proof of that. Um, one thing that always comes up. Especially again, on husband and wife team, as an example, is um, all you heavy equipment business. So, guys got a couple dozers and an excavator. Wife doesn't have much to do with the business, but they're married, so they want to use one of their small business. Like, okay, well, does she know what your business does? Does she have anything to do with that? Okay, then no, you can't do it. Um, it used to be something that was taken advantage of back in the day, um, but there's been a lot of cracking down on that. So if you are in those circumstances, I'm going to tell you no. I'll be straightforward. I'll, I'll work the day it off. Um, the eligible person must also be socially and economically disadvantaged. So um, if you are not in one of the presumed categories on the right, there are ways you can still apply for the programs. However, you have to be able to prove that you're socially and economically disadvantaged. Basically, you got to prove, prove that you yourself were discriminated, discriminated on for some reason, if you're not in a presumed category. Um, so the presumed categories are because of federal and state rules and regulations. Um, so if you fall in one of the categories, you're good to go. We don't have to dive deeper into that. Um, yeah, go ahead. So before you apply, um, there are several different ways that you can do this, but with the way my brain functions and the way that makes it a little bit easier for y'all to do is review the information that's required. Decide before you apply if it is right for you, because um, it can take a long time. So if you decide to do this on the federal side of the house with the Small Business Administration as a woman in small business, you're looking at a year before you can get certified. <coughs> Um, OMWBE never takes that long, like never. So you don't have to worry about that part of it. Um, but it's making sure you have everything before you start applying. Um, I will never pretend that I know all of the required documents because OMWBE does not do a great job of putting all of that up front. A lot of those you can figure out along the way. Um, but it's basic information like your business license, is a certificate of formation, um, your operating agreement if you're an LLC. Uh, your bylaws, if you're a corporation. If you're a sole prop, that's a whole different piece. Um, but you'll have to have your basic business documents, your birth certificate or and or passport, driver's license, um, legal authority to occupy your space, so lease, whatever that is. Um, the bank or uh, 
recorded documents. Go ahead. And then somewhere along the lines, you got to figure out whether or not you want to do state certification or federal certification. But um, a lot of people don't do it in this order. Um, I would highly encourage you to do it in this order, only because it makes your life a heck of a lot easier. <coughs> but um, meet with your APEC advisor. So are you saying the federal slide takes a lot longer for the state? But through you should all, start them both at the same time? Through OMWBE, no, it's the same time. If you're going through the Small Business Administration, which are two separate, yes. <coughs> So the small way of WBE is, is contractors. Yeah. Yeah. So we need some yes. Um <laughs> so generally I say meet with your APEX advisor. So in this case, you're in my county, so it's me. Um I do have one person that helps me. Her name is Leslie Miller. She was actually my predecessor three, four people ago. Um she tried to retire and um, didn't do a good job of retiring and she came back to help. <laughs> so thank, thank goodness for her. Um, if you had been a client way back in the day, you worked with her and not me. And now she's back. So it's kind of neat. But uh, you'll create an account with all of WBE certification portal and then go through the application process. Um, generally speaking, we gather most of the documents up front. There's a few documents that you can't gather up front that you have to download from their site. So there's a personal net worth form and an affidavit that you would download directly from their site. I have a version, but it is not a sufficient version because it's not the certified version, which it always makes me debate. Um, and then if you are married, there is also a relinquishment form for your spouse to sign stating that they have no interest in your business if the spouse is not a business person. Um, you'll go through the application, which I can go through the application with you um, to answer the question. So just in case there's something question you don't understand or need clarification on, I'll help you with that piece. And then going through the document upload to you as well at the end. Go ahead. Um, so how does it work? We kind of touched base on this, so I won't go too deep on this. Um, right now, those fees that you see on the screen are not applicable, um, but this is also why I generally say apply for both at the same time, is if these fees were applicable and that bottom line hasn't been updated, they just approved it to go through June 2025. So um, basically, if the fees were applicable, the reason one of the other reasons why I say apply for them both at the same time is you're only going to pay that $25 fee for both applications if you apply for federal and state at the same time. If you apply for them separately, these are the fees associated with it. So when those fees are no longer waived, this is what you should be looking at. Um, the renewal piece, because they end up separate, you won't be forking out $150 every year. Be twenty five dollars each year for federal, and then a hundred dollars every per year for state. Go ahead. So we kind of went through this already, but types of documents. This is not an exclusive list um, because everybody's business functions a little bit different, which would mean that there are different documents required. So if you're a trucking company, for example, you would have to show additional insurance. If your um, trucks are over the twenty five thousand. 26,000 one pound threshold, then you would need to have that uh, DOT inspections and all of those other documents to go with it. Um, some of them ask for a list of employees, but if you don't have any employees, obviously you don't have a list. Um, and then there's other specific insurance questions that it asks for on the document list as well that if you don't have, you can't upload it, so it doesn't apply to you. Go ahead. Um, what to expect. So once you submit your application, it usually only takes about seven days to be, and this is federal and state, on, in the OMWBE portal. Um, it usually only takes about seven days to be assigned an analysis. Um, once your analysis starts reviewing your main documents, they will always ask more questions. <laughs> I used to say if uh, they had questions, they would reach out, but it's always. They will always have more questions. Um, if you're confused or need help or just want um, some comfort going through the additional questions, you can talk to me on the 
you know, so you can talk about it or read about it, whatever you guys need. Um, where that said, it says if on the screen, it should say when it requires additional information. They'll give you an email and they give you generally like eight days roughly to answer it. Um, a uh, recent trick in the trade that I learned is the faster they do respond, the faster you get. Uh, one of my women owned small businesses that just got certified, it took her like three weeks. So it was that fast. Um, because every time she got the email, when she got home that day, she was more quicker. She was done. But she also does a, the amount of paperwork this company needed was very light. Um, she was just a consulting firm and it was just her. So it was pretty quick to get through it. Um, bigger companies with employees and other things that take a little bit longer to get through the process because it's more paper. Uh, go ahead. Um, typically, for the state certification, it can take up to 60 days. Um, with a caveat on both of these, is that every time they ask for something, they, depending on what happens, the clock can restart. Um, but it, I have not seen one take more than three months as long as everybody was doing what they were supposed to be doing. Go ahead. Um, so if you need help and you're not in my area, um, if you happen to have traveled from somewhere outside of my area, we have counselors, again, all the way across the state. Uh, now we go through one direct email to start with, and then after you've been assigned your counselor, um, you get that counselor's email address and the way to uh, schedule appointments with that person. We all function a little bit differently. I love Calendly. I'm a big fan of it. it saves my life when it comes to the back and forth emails um because i do have some clients that will ask me for days we'll give them a list and i don't hear from them for like three weeks and all these things are all that um but that's the best thing what happens today to people too go ahead so what happens next so once you go through all of this work you are put on the ONWBE list of certified firms um, we kind of touched base on this earlier. So, if uh, Ronnie, for example, or the Economic Alliance needed somebody to come in and clean or had a door replaced or anything like that, and they wanted to utilize a certified firm, they would go to the OMWPD website, they would click on directory of firms, they would search for exactly what they're looking for, um, and then they would find if there were certified firms in that area, they would find what they were looking for the job. Now, that includes like uh, you see the business, the point of contact phone number, and the contact for that point of contact. Go ahead. So that's it for that portion of it. And that's all I got. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Probably a million. Right now, Probably my mind is like, right what did she just say? <laughs> so with that, y'all, this is Nathaniel Harris. He is like, what would what's the best term? One of my uh, favorite Ooh. success stories. Um, <laughs> so, uh, he is one of my yeah, he's one of my poster child. I guess would be the right way to say that. So Nathaniel's been through like every single hoop. Um, that is like humanly possible to have to jump through, including the winning contracts. So if there's anything that you would uh, want to ask like firsthand, um, feel free because he's here right in the room to ask. Um, he is, one thing I do have to say is in this field, if this is where you want to go, you have to be coachable. Um, and the reason for that is because I'm not the only person you get <laughs> when it comes to all this. There's a lot of things that you guys are going to need help with that I can't help with, that I won't have the ability to help with. So I will lean on my local small business development centers for that kind of help. Um, so your guys' gentleman, I believe, is Lou. Is, is, it, is it still Lou here? It's Lou. Yeah. Um, and then I also lean on like the Economic Alliance as well. Um, in that aspect, uh, the women, there's a Women's Business Center in Spokane. I do believe she does Zoom appointments for outside of Spokane. I'm pretty sure she does. Um, but it's not, you don't just get one of us as a resource to help. We're like, I don't know, I refer to us as your cheerleading squad, but other people would like to 
say advisory board <laughs> instead of truly squad. So it's not just I don't know everything. I'm never going to pretend I know everything. There's a lot of things I'm learning brand new firsthand with this person right here. So, um, yeah, it's there's a lot to it. Um, I never, ever, ever will ever say here I taught you this once. We're never talking about it again because that's not what it's not in any way. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't good, really. <laughs> Probably not, but uh, there's even things like when I go through research on USC spending, I'll go through a one with the client and then a couple months later, they like, I don't mean to bug you or ask again, but can we go through that? Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Yeah. My God. So I would love to hear Nathaniel's stories about winning contracts. Winning contracts? Yeah. I haven't. Well, what do you think about winning contracts? Like, you know, certified from the state of Washington. Um, I don't know. I went to Little Business Center, Spokane, Washington. Uh, just to quote Nancy, my business program. Um, so she got my business plan, all that stuff like that. And she uh, directed me to the, the MLK, you know, Carl Maxis Center, and it was happening again. And I met Mr. Joel, he worked with the SBA, and I said, Mr. Joel, I'm trying to get this cake with the contract. He said, Well, you got to start on solution. You got to get certified on that, you can do all the stuff they want. You get certified to be, what does it say, to approve me to be the master? The state way contract. So the main contract. Well, you know, you're telling me, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that's not my capability statement. That's not my federal letters. Uh, now, hiring English, Spanish, Russian. Yeah, Russian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Russian. 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 Yeah, and I'm still giving to me because I'm a scotch I have to go knock on the doors. And I, was, I heard this and that from my, my advisors. We don't utilize it. Well, I'm going to find out. I'll be back. You know what I mean? So I'm going to keep coming. She said, especially if one might be on the other side, come on, give me a job. So it's a lot of Take time, but it's easy. You can do it, though. Especially when that's the least help. She will find out. If sometimes she will, she will find out that you know how to. But I don't I don't do it alone. I really do it needs to be sports partner thing. So and that's a lot of what what we do. So for the business side of the house, so I help with all things government contracting, but for the business side of the house, I absolutely rely on the the business focus. And that's where what Nathaniel was kind of talking about. So like the getting ready for loans and stuff like that, that's completely out of my workhouse. But I do have people <laughs> that resource partners that I do work with that helps with that. So I guess to expand a little bit more on your Nathaniel's story about winning contracts. It was a long road. <laughs> it was a really long road that we went through together. Um, so the statewide janitorial contract came up for bid. Um, Nathaniel bid on it, and he was an apparent successful bidder. Uh, we had to wait quite some time because somebody had protested it, and then he was awarded the contract. And then from there, there's a whole lot more steps to go through because it's like a blanket for that statewide contract. It's not. Just okay, you're gonna go work for Okanagan County and you're gonna go clean buildings A, B, C, D. It's kind of it serves as a blanket. So underneath that blanket, there's a huge pile of agencies that are allowed and or required to use it. Um, and then he just keeps going from there. But he has to keep that marketing piece up because it's a blanket one, they have a whole list of people to pick with. And if you don't get in front of them, that's not something that he's gonna get. So uh it's just those pieces. Did we answer your question? I will say yes. What about the getting certified hub zone certified at the same time, or is that a different type of process? So uh hub zone is historically under you launched as a zone. 
and that certification is through the Small Business Administration. So okay. completely different base. Um, I am an early, I'm a participant in the Early Engagement Initiative Program. Um, so what that means is you get yanked out of the national stack and put into a shorter stack, and I hope you get faster. Um, which is where my brain ticks because with that process going through that certification, you literally gather all of your documents first. Um, the hub zone application is the only application you have to sit down, start, and finish in one sitting. Um, OMWBE is not like that. You can start and be like, okay, I can't brain system overload. I gotta, I gotta step back um, and come back. Okay, you have, <laughs> yeah, or that. I forgot the paper. I can't finish it today. Um, but hub zone is not like that. Like you gather all of your documents up front. Um, you go through the application process. You have ten days to submit it. everything in one zip folder. It all has to go in. Um, doing the early engagement initiative program, I have a, a scoring sheet or a screening tool that I give you a copy of, and I submit it directly to the hub zone office, mm -hmm. um, and then they yank your uh, application and all your documents out of the giant stack and you go back. Um, I had a client a week ago, two weeks ago, apply, and they already yanked it out for them. Um, and so we're meeting again tomorrow to go through the two documents that he's missing, and he pro will probably be certified by Um, So it's a lot faster. And on the federal side of the house, all of them can take up to 90 days, but that up to 90 days, again, at each phase, that clock can reset based upon what happens during that transaction period. Um, if you are a owner operator and there isn't a lot of means to your business, so like you don't have a lot of overhead, you don't have a lot of employees, you don't have, it, it's fast to get certified in that um, aspect. And one of the advantages to the hub zone certification is that if your company was, if it was full and open competition, not set aside for a small business, what the federal government does to make you more competitive is they'll take your price, um, multiply it by 10, so they'll knock off 10%. Mm -hmm. You'll still get paid what you're bidding, but they'll use that lesser one to keep you in that competitive pool. Um, forest service specifically, um, I have a lot of fire suppression clients that will go get their hub zone certification because they get a 5% advantage. Those are all set aside for small businesses. But what they do for fire suppression is that um they will cap it at a 10 percent um because if you have three certifications that's 15 percent that's a huge advantage of your competitors so they cap it to make it even um but you'll go you'll set your daily rate they'll multiply that by five percent and that could be for one of my clients he went from number 12 on the list to number six on the list just from that certification um so they just refer to this or based off the of price um, so he moved up six, so he went out a lot more um, just from having that certification. That's like a whole more hour to two hours. <laughs> I've done that before, so I don't think it so. But you do one on one? Yes. So, yes, I do one on one a lot. It's a, lot, it's a lot easier for some companies to do one on one because you don't want to ask questions in front of a group, even though like everybody else in the room is probably the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so if there's no other questions, I guess we'll wrap it up there. I'd like to thank Alicia Rodell again for joining us and leading this training. We will be sending out uh, the slide deck as well as the capability sheet templates and a survey that we'd like you all to complete to give us some feedback. We also recorded this meeting and we will be uploading it to our YouTube channel so you can go back and watch it any any time and review what we learned here today. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.
for your advice to us now.